Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Love in the Time of Dementia, Remembering a Forgotten Dimension of Care with John Swinton. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for John by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel that's also located in the same panel. Um, and we're, we're gonna collect these questions during the presentation and we'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end where we hope to address as many as we can. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Fichette, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Thanks, Andy. Um, uh, hello, friends. Want to add my word of welcome to everybody who's joined us here uh, for the webinar and my appreciation for uh, the team that put this together and for John Swinton for uh, his time and for joining us. Before I turn this over to Sarah to introduce um, um, today's program, I just want to um, uh, make one quick announcement, and that is uh, one of the activities we have with Transforming Chaplaincy to help chaplains develop research literacy is uh, what we call Chaplain Research Summer Camp. We still have some seats left in summer camp. Uh, we're going to do it in person this summer in Chicago uh, for the week of July 11th. So uh, information about summer camp is on the Transforming Chaplaincy website transformchaplaincy.org. So if you are interested in joining us for Research Summer Camp, we'd love to have you come. Um, uh, look on the website for information. If you have any questions, ask, uh, uh, send an email to Andy and we'll be glad to provide you with that information. Um, let me uh, express my appreciation to Sarah McAvoy and Catherine Lines who have kicked off at Transforming Chaplaincy's Elder Care Research Network. Uh, we're really excited about um, uh, being able to bring chaplains together who are interested in improving spiritual care through research and care for um, older adults. Sarah is transitioning um, from a 35-year career as a licensed nursing home administrator to uh, becoming a, a chaplain, and we're delighted to have her um, as a co-lead for the Elder Care Research Network. Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, George. And thank you, Andy, for handling our tech. George, not only your warm welcome, but for putting us in contact with Professor Swinton. Um, it's a real privilege for Kathy and I, who serve as co-conveners of the Transforming Chaplaincy Elder Care Research Network, to introduce John Swinton. Professor of Practical Theology and Pastoral Care, and Chair in Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen. For more than a decade, he worked as a registered mental health nurse. He also worked for a number of years as a hospital and community health, community mental health chaplain alongside people with severe mental health challenges who were moving from the hospital into the community. In 2004, he founded the University of Aberdeen Center for Spirituality, Health, and Disability. Professor Swinton has published widely in the areas of mental health, dementia, disability theology, spirituality and health care, qualitative research, and pastoral care. He's the author of a number of monographs, including Becoming Friends with Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship, Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of People with Mental Health Challenges, and Dementia, Living in the Memories of God. Welcome, Professor Swinton, and thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Sarah. The, um, first of all, good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you about a few things. Um, Zoom's a really strange way to communicate. I mean, I don't know how many of you people are out there, but what, all through that introduction, every time that anybody finished, they disappeared on my screen. And so eventually, um, it came down to me talking to me, because all I can see is me in the slides. So, so 
I don't know if that's good or bad, it's, it's kind of mysterious. Anyway, welcome to my office. This is this is my office. Oh, George has returned. We're still here, John. We love you. <laughs> I feel part of the community again. I feel loved. So welcome to my office. So this is this is the place where I, I do my theological work, but it's also the place where I do my musical work because I, I'm a musician and most other things. And music and theology are quite similar in some ways, but that's for another lecture. What I want to talk about tonight, so it was tonight for me and today for you, is um, to try and help us to think slightly differently about dementia by focusing in on something that's fundamental to all of us, which is the nature of love. But oftentimes people, particularly in a professional context, we, we get nervous about the word love, and quite rightly so, because there's safeguarding issues, but it's a very particular way I wanted to think about love. I and mean, when you see it, I think you'll see the significance and the importance of it. So we're going to be looking at love in the time of uh, dementia. And Andrew's my slide changer. So Andrew, could you slide to put onto the next slide, please? Um, Michael Verdi, who runs a very interesting organisation called Memory Bridge, you should, you should check it out somewhere. Uh, they have two videos. One video is called um, There is a Bridge, and the other one is called Love is Listening. There is a Bridge is fascinating because it, the title tells you what it's about. It says, no matter uh, where a person is, no matter how far on they are in their, their dementia journey, there's always a bridge that can be found to get from you and I to them and back again. And, and the video really goes into that in some detail. But in his most recent, in the most, their most recent uh, video, um, Love is Listening, right at the beginning, there's a fascinating scene where um, Naomi, Naomi Frail, who's a, a very interesting person who, who works alongside people with dementia, is talking to the, uh, an African-American lady, and her picture is here. Uh, and the, the, the conversation is fascinating. She says, um, the, at one point the woman says, well, I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. But then she looks at Naomi Frail and says, but your face is a picture of love. Isn't that beautiful? Your face is a picture of love. And actually when you see the whole scene, you can see what she means. When she looked at uh, Naomi, Naomi's face, she found a picture of love. Now the question is, when people living with dementia look at the faces of others, do they see a picture of love or do they see something quite, quite different? I mean, dementia is, is a difficult um, uh, condition to uh, experience in a culture like ours, in a Western culture because we are so focused on intellect and reason and memory as the essence of what's important in life, competitiveness, power, all of these things. But when you have a, a condition that starts to take that away from you, people begin to ask all sorts of questions like, oh, oh they're not the person they used to be. Oh, there's something horrible going on here. Oh, that, and so on and so forth. Why is that? It's not just because they have brain damage, it's because they have a culture that expects certain things of people. And if people don't meet up to these expectations, they're downgraded. And so there's something very important about looking, a person with dementia looking at somebody and seeing the face of love within a social context where that's very often not the way that people are, are viewed. The next slide. So I want us to begin like this. Um, if, you just, if you can just move through this slide, uh, Andrew. The, all human experiences have at least two stories that can be told about them. The first is biological and the other is spiritual. Next. So the first narrative strives to explain the technicalities of human life. So the, the, the physical narrative is all about your body. It's about your brain, it's about your neurons, it's about the way your body moves in, in through the world. And it's in there that medicine and psychiatry and psychology really find a lot of the, the locus in there. That's really, really important. So we tell stories about the physical body. So the physical story about dementia would be, oh, well, you have brain damage, there's, there's the neurons and synapses in your world, where, uh, your brain are either not working or damaged, so you have memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, so on and so forth. All of that's true. But that's not the only story. So there's a second story. 
And the second narrative uh, runs like this. It explores the meaning of people's experience. And here we discover the significance of issues of uh, love, relationship, loss, forgiveness, hope, meaning, purpose, spirituality, and God. Now, both of these stories are, ne are necessary. But sometimes, particularly in a highly um, medicalized culture like our own, the first story shouts so loudly that it overpowers the second story. And so what I want us to do today is to turn up the volume on the second story so that we can hear that aspect of people's lives. And when we hear it and notice it, we can begin to think about what it means to respond to it. So next slide. So the question is, are we really just our brains? Do we really cease to be who we are when our brains uh, begin to deteriorate? Sometimes it might fit, it sound that way. And sometimes the language that we use around people with dementia would indicate that, yeah, you've got brain damage, so therefore you're not the person that you used to be. But are we really just our brains? Next slide. There, there's some really interesting uh, research that looks at the impact of loneliness on uh, neural activity and, and the activity of, in the brains of people with dementia. And it seems to indicate that if a person is um, deprived of social relationships, it not only affects you psychologically in that sense, it actually uh, affects you neurologically. Because you know the way the brain works is it, it, me, it works in response to the world. So it's not like a, a standard genetic pattern where your hair grows or your teeth grow. Your brain grows in response to your experience. So every time you experience something, it's kind of registered in the neurons and the synapses of your brain, and that, that it really becomes part of you, that experience. That's just why childhood experiences that are, diff that are difficult can be so difficult because you, then they become wired in and you have to rewire them. But what the research says is that loneliness uh, causes uh, neural deficiency. Because the way that also the way the brain works is that if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you're not relating with people over time, then that those parts of your brain that function in, in relation to relationships begin to deplete. And so even in the context of dementia, where you've already got uh, brain damage, that brain damage will be exacerbated if a person is isolated and lonely. And loneliness very often is one of the key experiences for people living with uh, dementia. So you can see the, the way that your, your brain and your body and your, and your social experience all come together to make us who we are, even in the midst of the experience of dementia. So next uh, slide, please. Um, but there's also some interesting experience that talks about the idea of dementia. If we can move on through that slide. So dementia works like this. So dementia is conventionally defined in terms of neurological change in the brain and an inevitable, inevitable and progressive decline in the individual's cognitive powers and functional ability. However, if we move on, uh, there's some really interesting research that, that pushes us to think slightly differently about that. So pioneers within the area of dementia studies such as Professor Tom Kipwood, who some of you may be familiar with, have shown that the symptoms of dementia <clears throat> are determined by people's specific neurological impairments, by their own personality and their life history, and crucially, by their social psychology. In other words, how we treat people with, de with dementia is not only a, a matter of compassion, but actually it's to do with the way in which we configure and reconfigure uh, our, our brains in that sense to uh, respond to uh, relationships. Uh, next, next dimension, please. So it's argued that appropriate care interventions have a considerable impact on the progress of dementia. And the way that it runs is this. Uh, if you put somebody into an environment where there's no stimulation, where there's no relationships, then the chances are they will regress. If you put somebody in an environment where there's good relationships, good spirituality, good sense of community, then people can very often 
uh, 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 reclaim aspects of their lives that seem to be lost in previous situations. So, next slide. So, we get this idea that some, some degree of rementia, with the regaining of lost cognitive and functional abilities, is possible for some individuals. Now, it's not a cure for dementia, but it does indicate that dementia is not simply a neurological thing. It's a social thing, it's a psychological thing, it's a thing that runs across communities. And there's a very real sense in which when one person has dementia, we all have dementia because we're all responsible for it. Yes, the dementia may be manifested in the, the brain of a single individual, but actually the way in which we treat that individual, the type of communities that we, we create, the types of uh, approaches that we have to them, really are profoundly important in terms of impacting upon what's going on. If we could just go right through this uh, slide, please, Andrew. So given the appropriate social, psychological, and spiritual simulation, some degree of uh, cognitive decline can be, if not prevented, slowed down. And you're always surprised when you put somebody in that kind of environment as to what they are able, capable of doing. Next slide. So the first point I want us to think about is this, being human, we are our brains, but we're much more than just our brains. Obviously we are our brains, but even our brains are social objects. Even our brains are connected to our relationships, connected to our communities in that sense. And there's never really a time when the, what goes on only goes on inside our cranium. Actually, it's always going on within shared craniums, if you like. And that becomes really important when we're thinking about how we can understand dementia and how we can understand uh, and respond to it in relation to that second narrative that we may tell about it. So moving on to the next slide, the, um, I did a little bit of research a couple of years ago for um, Aberdeen City Council. I live in Aberdeen in, in Scotland, which of course is the best city in Scotland, so don't let anybody tell you anything else. The, um, and what happened was um, they wanted me to do, have a look at dementia services and then uh, suggest some innovative ways in which services could be improved. And, and it was a very interesting piece of work. I, I enjoyed doing it. But one thing I noticed straight away was the way in which services were framed in the city uh, was um, difficult. So if we can have the next slide, I'll show you, I'll show you what, what I mean. So this is the dementia care pathway for Aberdeen City, or it was two or three years ago. Uh, so you see the person's worried about their memory or identity, they're screened by their general practitioner or family practitioner, referred to a, specific, a specialist who confirms the diagnosis and then post-diagnostic support and all that way. But what you'll notice about that uh, diagram, which at one level is, I mean, it, it lays out what's happening, that's good, it's, it's, these are the services that are there. But it's a downward movement. It's a pathway moving downwards towards inevitable decline and death. It, it, there's no sense in that pathway of the positive dimensions of people's lives, what they might want to help them to grow even in the midst of the difficulties. So obviously, dementia is, is a, a condition that declines. However, that's not all that it does. And so I want to suggest to you that maybe a better way to think about uh, the dementia uh, experience is to think about it in terms of a journey and we'll see in this next slide that I'll, I'll go through what, what I mean by that. Journey, next part uh, Andrew. So a pathway is a course of action aimed at achieving a specific result or specified result. A journey is the act of traveling from one place to another. One is instrumental and focused on hope, uh, on hope for clinical outcomes. The other is flexible, person-centered, and open to surprises. Next part, Andrew. A journey is somewhat, something one embarks upon willingly or otherwise as one moves from one place to another. Along the way, you meet people and encounter situations, some of which are helpful, some of which are not. But each encounter changes the direction of your journey. Some encounters change the meaning of your journey. 
In practice, the journey of people living with dementia and their supporters is often closer to the winter journey of a displaced refugee than an organized summer hike. Next part, Andrew. But the thing about journeys is that they are going somewhere. They're not static and meaningless. Journeys have a destination. And I think it's really, really important. Uh, life with dementia is not static and meaningless. It's a journey that has a destination. And that destination is not simply the end of your life. It's actually a continued movement into the possibility of joy. So I think when we think about uh, dementia as a journey, recognizing how complicated and difficult and painful journeys can be, it does give us that sense of movement and hope when along the way, we might be able to find modes of joy that were surprised, those surprises. So next slide. So I want us just to, to, to get in our minds that part of that journey uh, uh, of dementia is a journey of love. Now, I don't know if you ever think about what love is. I mean, love is all sorts of things. You know, you love your dog, you love your ice cream, you love whatever it is. Like, and so it can become a word that's, that's pretty well watered down. But this is how I'd like us to think about it tonight. So love is to do with adopting an attitude where then you look at other people, position them positively, value their existence, and show that you are genuinely glad that they are with you. And so the, the way in which uh, uh, the theologian Joseph Pieper has, has put that is, uh, love is saying to the other person, uh, it's good that you exist, and I'm glad that you are here. Right? It's as simple as that. It's good that you exist. I'm glad that you are here. Now, the power of love in that context is that that idea, it's good that you exist. I'm glad that you're here, is the exact opposite of the way culture oftentimes thinks about people living with dementia. Oftentimes, culture thinks it's not good that you're here, and we're not glad that you exist. So I'm presuming that the reason that you're here today is to think through these things. Uh, and the counterculture and powerful thing that you and I can do right away is to love one another. <laughs> Sounds a bit corny, but you know what I mean? To, to, to say to one another, it's good that you exist and I'm glad you're here. To act to, towards one another, it's good that you exist and I'm glad that you're here. When we get that rhythm, we begin to see ourselves differently and we begin to see dementia differently. Because, next slide, uh, one of the things about dementia, for the reasons I've already mentioned, is it's a culturally devalued condition. And it's highly stigmatized. You know, the way if you look at some of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, polls that are done, people are more afraid of cancer, uh, depression than they are of uh, dementia than they are of cancer. Uh, why is that? Because they think they're going to lose themselves, because they think that, that everything they had is lost, and so on and so forth. So it's a very negative story that uh, uh, runs along with dementia oftentimes. So it's culturally devalued, and it's highly stigmatized. Now, think about the idea of stigma. Stigma comes from the, the Greek slave trade, where a, a, a slave master would buy a, a, a slave and put a mark on that slave, and the slave would be reduced to the size of that mark. Like you have no name, you have no family, you have no friends, you're simply that mark. And stigmatized, and stigma does that. When you get a diagnosis of dementia, very often that happens. One of the things that's very clearly laid out in the literature is that as soon as you have a diagnosis of dementia, your friends start to, to move away. Uh, and they start to ascribe everything you do to that label. So eventually you, you don't become John or Jane or, or Jeffrey with dementia, you just become dementia. You can't do anything. You can't lose your keys anymore. It's a dementia. You can't get angry anymore. It's a dementia. And so eventually people get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the problem with that kind of stigma is you begin to live into it. When other people teach you that, treat you that way, you, you begin to uh, respond and live into that. So the question then is, how do we get value? Next slide uh, I'll show is uh, an indication. Right? So how do we get value? Well, value is always a gift. Like you can't really value yourself. Uh, uh, well, maybe you can. I mean, maybe if you've got particularly narcissistic tendencies, you, you get value all by yourself. But for most people, 
value is something that's given to you. You'll tell, you can't become a friend on your own. You have to be given the gift of friendship. So to value somebody is to gift something to them, to give them the, the dignity, to give them respect, to give them the possibility of uh, a, a hopeful relationship. But it's always something you've got to do in that sense. And so stigma and social devaluation takes away the gift, but the simple gift of presence and the gift of love, it's good that you're here and glad that you exist, opens up that space for revaluing uh, individuals uh, who have been profoundly devalued. So it's not complicated. You just have to change the cultural next slide. So go through the, uh, uh, sorry, through, yeah. So the, the <laughs> dementia can be a journey of hope that's marked by love, should be a journey of hope that's marked by love. So that's really important. Dementia could be, not always is, a journey of hope that's marked by love. There's lament in there, there's sadness, there's suffering, but the primary dynamic is, dynamic is the desire to love. So in order to be valued, in order to come to this space where you push against culture and, 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 and give people value, we need to realize uh, the significance of presence. Now, um, I was across in Australia for a year uh, in 2020, just before the, the pandemic is. And I was working with an, an organization there called Hammond Care, who provides specialist uh, 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 um, uh, care for people living with dementia. So progressive care for people living with dementia. Uh, and they asked me to do a, a piece of research looking at the, the significance of carer presence. One of the problems that uh, across aged care is the tendency for carers not to be present, like to be in the room, but not necessarily present. So if you've got a busy environment, either you're just getting on with the tasks and ignoring the person, or sometimes people just talk over the person as if they're not there or they're on the phone. Either way, there's an absence there. And as soon as there's an absence of presence, you see, as soon as your day-to-day -day tasks hum along under the hood, that's when difficulties arise, because you, become, you develop a culture where pretty difficult things uh, or wrong things become normalized. So in the next slide, I'll show you something interesting. And Andrew, if you can just go through all of the bits in this slide, all of it, that'd be great, thank you. Think about this. We check our phones every 12 minutes during waking hours. Some percent of us say that we never turn our phones off. 40% of us check our phones within five minutes of waking. Interesting, this recent study noted that those who uh, are distracted by emails and phone calls saw a 10 point fall in their IQ, which is twice that found in studies of the impact of smoking marijuana. So it's actually safer to smoke marijuana than to use Google. Not that I would recommend either, I hasten to ask. Um, but this, this is the point a lack of presence is rapidly becoming a cultural norm. When this implicit cultural norm is transferred into an aged care setting, problems will inevitably arise. And you can see it very easily. Four people sitting around the table, all on their phones, all present, all, but actually absent. So if you have a culture that says uh, absence is, an, is the norm, then you have a problem. Now, the way that we address that problem is, first of all, to notice that it's a problem. But second, again, to the, 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 the title of what I'm doing, to begin to think about the connection between love and presence. So next slide. So love and presence, love is necessary, or, for, or presence is necessary for love. Uh, next part, Andrew. Presence is the quality of being there for others and the ability to understand what kinds of caring practices most enhance them as human beings. So in order to be present, you need to be noticing people. In order to notice people, you need to understand people. In order to understand them, you need to take care. And uh, you need to take care, obviously, you need to be in a space where that worldview, that vision, it's good that you exist, I'm glad that you are here, shapes and forms what you see. Because <clears throat> the way that you describe something will determine what you think you see. 
what you think you see will determine the way you respond to it. So if you describe, if you describe somebody as hopeless or as not being there, whatever that might be, that's how you respond. If you describe somebody as uh, lovable, as somebody who you want to be with, and who you really are going to try really hard to be present with, then that's how you respond. So sitting at the heart of the caring task is that reframe, that focus in on presence in all of its dimensions. You know, there's a, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll give you an example in the next slide. One of my colleagues uh, who uh, works in a chaplaincy uh, with people who live with dementia told me this story uh, not so long ago. It's a story of, of Beatrice, uh, who is a lady who lives with uh, 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 advanced dementia. And she was very uncommunicative. She seemed not to be able really to do very much about very much. And uh, she uh, spent a lot of time just sitting in a chair with her head down. And on the whole, people tended to think, well, you know, she's a bit of a hopeless case. And of course, if you, if you, as soon as you have that thought in your mind, that's what you'll see. But she sat down, my friend sat down with her and said, Beatrice, I'd like to pray with you. Uh, and Beatrice didn't move. And so my friend said she was going to say the Lord's Prayer. So she said, Our Father. And as soon as she said, Our Father, Beatrice started to pray. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And she said, She prayed for about 10 minutes. Now my friend leaned in. She couldn't work out what was being said. It was, it was, it was kind of seemed to be, it wasn't understandable for her, but she was intentional about it. It meant something a lot to, uh, to Beatrice. And eventually, after the five minutes or whatever it was, my friend said, uh, Amen. And Beatrice stopped. So for that small space, Beatrice was a praying woman, um, which is the last thing that many people would have assumed that this woman, who seems to be completely uh, lost, is actually somebody who prays. Uh, and what the fascinating thing for me in that was that when you pray, God listens. More than that, when you pray, God acts. So Beatrice's prayers were listened to by God and acted upon. So somewhere in creation, something changed when Beatrice prayed. And the only way she was allowed to, put in that, to be put in that situation or to get in that situation where she was free to do this is because my friend paid attention, gave her the gift of presence, Give her the gift of value, give her the benefit of the doubt, and when that happened, everything changed. Uh, next slide. The um, uh, uh, sorry, the next slide after this one. There's a fascinating book by a uh, uh, Japanese theologian called Kusuka Kiyama, uh, and some of you may have been may be familiar with this book. It was written back in the 60s, but it still, uh, it still does good work, or at least the concept does. Uh, and the essay in there, the, 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 the book gets its title from, uh, runs like this. Uh, the average speed, that, uh, average speed that a human being walks at is three miles per hour. So Jesus, who is God, walks at three miles per hour. Jesus, who is God, who is love, walks at three miles per hour per hour. Love has its speed and it's a slow speed. Being with people living with dementia takes time and that's not easy because all of us live in a, in a really, well many of us work in a very busy environment and many of us live in a world where we're always on to the next task even before we finish it so we're doing one thing and our minds off to go do the next thing. But that won't work if we're going to be around people who live with dementia. Being with people like living with dementia takes time, and it takes a certain kind of time, slow time. Again, that countercultural idea, slow time, not fast time, but slow time. If Jesus is walking at three miles per hour and you're walking at, walking at nine miles per hour, then who's following who and who's taking the time to love in any given situation? Next slide. There's a beautiful uh, spiritual tradition uh, 
called the sacrament of the present moment. Um, and it runs like this. It runs that slow down, take it a, 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 a account of the fact that every breath that's given to you is given to you by God. And realize that all the life is simply a gift. And see where that takes you. But the beauty of that, I mean, those of you who are in this Zoom room, who have spent time with people who live with uh, dementia, uh, uh, will know that even in the advanced stages, there's times when you click in, where you suddenly find yourself locking in to that person and they to you, even for a, a second, something changes. If you're always moving quickly, if you're always moving simply getting tasks done uh, without actually being present for the individual, then you're going to miss these beautiful moments. So the sacrament of the present moment reminds us, yeah, it's busy, but we've got to find that, that little bit of space. And it's interesting, there's, there's some research done on micro breaks. Micro breaks uh, occur when in a busy environment, you just take two or three seconds to step outside and then step back in. And by stepping outside of that busy environment, you change your perspective. Because when you're in there getting, doing your work and everything else, you just you get overwhelmed. Step outside, you see things differently when you step inside. And the sacrament, sacrament is the present moment says, step back and step in, step back, step in. Now, so when we get to uh, 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 work through the significance of love, of presence, of timefulness, you can see that we will discover and be discovered in ways that are fresh and new. Next slide. And so one of the tasks that we have as carers, and uh, particularly as spiritual carers, is to remember one another. You know, one, the thing that strikes me as most disturbing about the lives of many people living with dementia is that they're forgotten. You know, as I speak to people even, even now who will say things like, I don't really want to go and visit my Aunt Gertrude, but I'd rather remember them the way they were. Um, and I understand why people say that. But the problem is that the person now is forgotten. So the person as they are just now is forgotten. It's like we're frozen in time, a, a space where everybody feels comfortable with us, but where we are now, we're written off and forgotten. And so very often for people with dementia, the problem is not simply that you forget things, but that, that other people forget you. And so one of the things that you and I can do in practical terms, is just remember people, hold on to them, give them the gift of value, and when you feel, all of us want to feel remembered in that sense. Like, uh, and when we do that, when we re remember one another in that, these kinds of ways, we kind of, uh, we uh, mirror the way that God responds to us as human beings. Uh, next slide, please. Because one of the beautiful things that, that comes out of scripture is the idea that no matter what happens, we're remembered by God. Samus says, when I am weak, he remembers me. And there's a great beauty in that, isn't it? It's not your memory or my memory that actually matters. It's, it's, it's God's memory. It's, it's, and God's memory isn't tied to our neurons. It's tied to that wonderful gift of love that he constantly gives to the, to the world, that God constantly gives to the world. And so there's never a time when we're lost in that sense. We're always found. We just maybe don't notice it. And for those of us around the uh, people who live with dementia, our job is to help people to find, feel remembered, help people to feel that they've been found again in that way, help people to experience the mirroring of God in that way. And so as I come to, to, to the end of what I want to, to talk to you about, um, uh, there's one last thing I want us to think about. Um, Andrew, could you skip the next slide and go to the, the one after that? What is dementia? This is how I'd like us to, to think about dementia, right? Dementia is first and foremost 
a meaningful human experience that happens to unique individuals who always have hopes, desires, and, 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 uh, 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 and possibilities for the future. So yes, it's neurological, yes, it's brain damage, yes, there's brokenness and suffering, all of these things. It's a meaningful experience. And our task is to work out what hope looks like in, in difficult times. It's a new set of stories that can be told about someone. And one of the problems, as I've been saying, is that very often it's a negative story that's told about somebody. And that's why we have to really overcome stigma. And one of the ways which you overcome stigma, mind your language. Watch what watch the way that you talk about people. Never talk about people as if they're not there. Always talk about people as if they're present. So it's a new set of stories that can be told about someone. Um, uh, some of these stories are positive, some of them are, are negative, but all of them contribute to the journey. It's an opportunity to challenge our assumptions that human beings are defined by memory and intellect, something that culture says is, is, is the case, but actually all of us intuitively know is not the case and from a spiritual perspective is clearly not the space so it's an opportunity to see society properly to see human beings properly it's an opportunity to learn how to care for one another better uh, next slide andrew it's an opportunity to understand discipleship more fully for those who are engaged with the church the big and fascinating question is what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus when you've forgotten who Jesus is? And when you begin to get into that question, it's, 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 you begin to realize that actually following Jesus or following whatever tradition you have is much more than simply knowing things about the God that you want to follow. It's, it's coming to know that, and that's a full-bodied experience that's not taken away by uh, the issues that are raised by dementia. Penultimately, it's a place of loss and sadness. And it is. I mean, I, 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 I've tried in this presentation, I try in all my work, to point towards uh, some positive dimensions of dementia and, and positive dimensions of how we can care for one another when we go through that experience. And I don't, I do that unashamedly because there's so much negativity around that the more positivity there is, the better. But bottom line is, it's difficult. It's difficult for people who live with dementia, it's difficult for those that have to watch that. It's difficult for those to see profound changes in those who love. So we need to have lamentation in the midst. We need to be able to articulate our sadness and our brokenness in the same way as the psalmist articulates sadness and brokenness, but always in the context of love. Now, it's interesting. Uh, the psalms of lament, there's more psalms of lament in the Bible than anything else. They have a structure. And it, was, it runs like this. Most of them, not all of them, most of them. First, this big outcry, this is terrible. God, how could you have allowed this to happen? How can the wicked win? How can the, the, these terrible things happen? And, but then something changes in the middle of it. And suddenly the psalmist recognizes God's, has said, God's love. And nothing changes in the situation, but he sees it differently. And so he goes on and, and praises and feels, okay, I think I can cope with this. I think we need to think to find ways in which we can enable people with dementia and families to go through that process, to recognize the power and the pain of the pain and the suffering, but also to allow that reframing that comes from the kind of love that we've been talking about, to take away something of the sting of that so that people can live as well as possibly, even in the midst of the complexities. And finally, uh, dementia is a neurological condition that affects memory, cognition, behavior and self-awareness. Now normally we would begin with that as our understanding of, of, of uh, dementia. I would suggest to you that you put it at the bottom, not because it's unimportant, but because it's liable to distract you from these other dimensions which are equally as important and that second narrative that runs alongside the, the biomedical and neurological chemical uh, narrative. That last point is really important. So we need to, uh, medicine is really important, but it doesn't define the whole experience. There are other dim dimensions. And finally, last slide. To go back to uh, what I've been uh, using as my mantra for this talk, it's good that you're here and I'm glad that you exist. I mean, I don't know where you are. I don't know uh, who you're with just now, 
But I would suggest to you, I would ask you, either say that to somebody who's sitting beside you now, or the next time you see somebody, say that to them. And you can be guaranteed you'll see them differently. You can be guaranteed they'll smile, unless they're feeling grumpy that day. And you can be guaranteed that something changes. And so love in the time of dementia means putting into practice these words. It's good that you're here, and I'm glad that you exist. And when we do that, I feel very positive about the future. I think we can bring about change. I think we can bring about the re-evaluation of people with dementia. And I think all of us can make the world a little bit of a better place if we just uh, uh, take some time and space to love our neighbours. So thank you, uh, thank you for uh, listening. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, or to sing a song, depending on what you want. <laughs> John, I have a, a question for you from from reading the book. Um, just can you talk a little bit about the holding of identity in our bodies that we do and how that might um, affect carers and the care that they give and, and how that maybe reveals itself in, in spending time with people? Yeah, if I understand your question properly, um, normally when we think about uh, memory, we think about recall memory. So we bring back uh, something from the past into the present so that we can think about what's happening with it in the future. Uh, and people do lose uh, uh, recall memory. Uh, really, once you get past 50, you start to lose recall memory. Um, but certainly people with, with dementia do. But that's only one dimension of, of memory. We also have body memory. Uh, we also make, Because as we engage with the world, as we do our day-to-day -day tasks, our, our brains shape and form, as into remembering things about the world through our bodies. And so, you know, musicians will be still, they often still be able to play their, their instruments, um, but also people will be able to worship. Uh, so people will raise their hands or they'll pray or they'll, they'll, they'll dance or whatever it is. Um, uh, and the temptation then is to say, isn't that queen? Isn't that queen? But actually what you see is that over time, people have practiced the spiritual, engaged in the spiritual practices, and now that's become part of their bodies, and now that they can't necessarily cognate it, the bodies the body still remember these things. Uh, and so these are meaningful gestures rather than just reflexes in, in that way. So uh, in relation to how that impacts upon you as, as a carer, well, recognizing that uh, actions like that are not meaningless, and that when somebody is doing something or doing something, for example, repetitively, that's not just meaningless and it's not just bad behaviour. There actually may well be memory wrapped up in that and that part of our task is to work out what is helpful and what is unhelpful. And so beginning by, by, by recognising uh, a learning, or rather learning how to read bodies in that way, as well as you know, all the other tasks we have, is a, a beginning point for, for pushing into the area you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Are there any um, questions from the the question box? There you are. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. I just uh, was very moved by what you said, and and appreciate your time with us today. A couple people have written about caretakers, and if you have any suggestions for them on how to help them with, you know, decreasing burnout, distress, and how to help them accept and cope working with a loved one or when they struggle with um, not being able to recognize their loved one in that person anymore? Well, there's a, a number of issues in there. The, the first, the first um, point I make is the carers, uh, it's not possible for somebody to be well cared for if carers are not well cared for. So creating structures and participating in structures where that enhance the abilities of, of carers to cope is fundamentally important. And so the, a, a variety of different community, religious communities as one example, but other communities could, could do it as well. To give people respite. You know, it's interesting, my, just now my, my mom, she's uh, 97 and she still lives at home, but she's, she's starting to fail now. And so we've got quite a big family. So somebody's there 
24 hours a day. Anyway. Um, and it's exhausting. And she hasn't got dementia, but it's just exhausting because it's claustrophobic. You, because you, 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 want, you know, you're just trapped in this little space. And so is she. I mean, so it's not just me. Uh, what is profoundly relieving is if you can just get two hours to go out, to go out for a walk, to go out and do something different, to get out of that tiny space. So I think offering people the possibility of even short periods of respite is, is fundamentally important, regularly, not just once off, not like, like a grand gesture. Uh, and I think that takes a lot of the pressure off if, if we can structure that probably off that. It's not, it's not a big commitment to, to anybody or any group of people just to go and sit with somebody for two hours while the, while the other person goes away. So I think you, religious community can do that, other communities can do that very easily. Uh, the issue of, uh, of not being recognised by your loved one uh, is profoundly painful. Uh, it, I mean, the way, the re, when you look at the research, it's at that, that point there where either family or friends are not recognised by the individual that people start to talk about the individual as not being there. So it's, it's kind of like, a, a, it's kind of like a, a pivotal point, really, in that sense. Like. And I think uh, what you have to do is grieve there. I mean, I think that it's necessary to, to engage in a process of, of grieving, because that is a big deal when, when somebody you love doesn't uh, doesn't see you in the same way as it did. However, they haven't changed radically. They haven't changed who they are. They've changed. That what's happened is that their ability to do something highly significant in life is no longer available to them. So they haven't become another person. And so I think the key is uh, uh, working through ways in which you can really uh, acknowledge that grief and, and move on. And one of the things that uh, I think we haven't looked at in enough detail is the role of ritual in the, in the, in the life journey of, of people living with dementia. Uh, because as, as a con as a, I mean, the, one of the things is a constant series of changes, so it's, it's quite complicated to know what a single group of rituals would be. But one area for ritualization would be that space there. So it's a bit like a, you know, a funeral is, has to do with recognizing, uh, along with friends, that the physical uh, uh, person that you used to know is no longer there. And you have to work out a way of internalizing that and, and, and dealing with the, the new reality. Now, it's not the same thing for, for dementia, because you wouldn't be ritualizing the fact that somebody's not there, but you would be ritualizing the fact that something is significant has changed uh, and that you need to acknowledge and value what has happened beforehand, but also being able to move into that transition into this new way of being alongside of this individual whom you continue to love, even though that change is there. And so that managing that grief, I think, is, 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 a, is a key point. Uh, and I, I don't know that we always, we being a, uh, uh, people who are responsible for uh, uh, that kind of care and that kind of spiritual care, I don't know if we always manage that transition uh, as well as we could. That's really helpful. You're reminding me of a friend of mine who said that when her mom, her dementia was so severe, she recognized that her mom was not there in the same way, but that she was still a person. And then that was that recognition of her mom as a person is what enabled her to stay connected with her mom in a new way. Another question that's come in is about the um, cultural differences and how dementia is viewed. And are you aware of any perspectives where people might be better off with dementia in other cultures? That's interesting. I, I did a, I did a, a web conference with some colleagues in Malaysia. Uh, a couple of months ago. And I talked about some of the things we've been talking about uh, in relation to the overemphasis on the intellect and the way in which you, you, your personhood is constructed by memory and cognition, all these things. Uh, and she was saying that in, in Malaysian culture, uh, that doesn't really apply. Because in, in Malaysian culture, your personhood is determined by your place within community. So therefore it's not determined by your, your cognitive ability or your capabilities. And so people have a very different attitude there, uh, where when people do encounter dementia, they're not taken out of that community and put into, uh, well, sometimes they are, but the ideal is not to do that. 
because that actually that's where the the, the problems come with the, the personhood when they're taken out of their own community and placed in a if you like an isolated space uh, an alien space then so so the issue of person is still there but it's just it's just a very different way of understanding persons um, uh, uh, different across culture. Uh, although I think it applies to us because our, our person in many senses, everybody's person is created and is held by a community. We just don't quite notice it in, in a Western individualistic cu culture. I know we only have three minutes and I want to respect people's time with this. I did want to give um, an, a shout out for the book. Well, let's, let's move it over here. In both the chat and the question box in the panel that Andy had told us about at the beginning, you can still get 40% off from the book through tomorrow. And the link is in, like I said, in the chat and the queue, the question box. And we also wanted to, if you're interested in joining any of the research networks that were mentioned at the beginning, there's a link to those research networks as well. There were several people who asked for a little music and I wonder if that would be a great, a good way. To end. I, I, I know that I couldn't because there's a delay. And, and it, uh, it, yeah, that's true. That's true. Sarah, it never works. So, in the minute we I, have- But I do have a- I do, Go ahead. I couldn't do it uh, because I tried it before and it just- uh, Sure, yeah. <laughs> It would seem like it was, one is a situation where you have to go, oh yeah, do it, do it, do it, and then I do it, and you'll go, oh. <laughs> For sure. Sarah, do you have anything, or John, anything in the one minute we have left with um, everybody? John, I just want to express my gratitude. Your presentation was just lovely and um, really helps as caregivers to think about and frame things, um, see things differently. I'm going to take advantage of the 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 short breaks um, to stay in live time and, and be with people. So thank it's, you so much. It's good that you exist and we're very grateful that you're here. <laughs> That's kind of you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for us too. Thank you to all our viewers for coming today. It was uh, a real gift to be with you all today. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks John. Thank you. All right, see you, Andy. I don't know how to get out of this, so I can't see how you can You'll see. be all right. You can, yeah, you can just log out. I'm ending it, so it'll it'll close. All right. It's like Hotel California. <laughs> <laughs>